In this episode, we're going to talk about trademarked logos in films and how to avoid this. This is something that I see quite frequently in independent films. And to be honest, I've seen it in a few big-budget films too, and those usually make the news. This is something that a lot of newer filmmakers don't think about, and even those of us that know better sometimes overlook some. So we're going to talk about some ways to avoid making this error. Now, some people might think, hey, what does it matter if there's a trademark name or logo or something recognizable in my film? Well, the problem is, it can lead to a lawsuit. At the very least, it can lead to assist and decease order, which means that you'd have to pull your completed film off the shelves and re-edit it, and if that logo happens to be smack in the middle of a crucial scene, you might end up, at best, reshooting, and at worst, shelving your film indefinitely. Big corporations don't necessarily like their logos running around in the independent film industry. While you might think to yourself, hey, it's free advertising to them, they don't always see it that way. It is very easy to find products to use as props and set pieces that do not involve any types of logos. You can find very plain furniture and bedding pretty much anywhere. You can go to general stores and find knives and jewelry and all kinds of things that don't have logos on them. And if you need things like wrapped candy or food items, you can usually find them in very generic wrapping. Now, the most common place that I see branded names and logos is on actors. Usually background actors, but there have been quite a few films I've seen where it's been right out in the open with the leading or supporting character. This usually happens whenever a production has asked their cast to bring their own wardrobe. Actors, especially unseasoned ones, don't necessarily know to avoid logos or name brands or cartoon characters or whatever on their clothing. This is why it's so very important to have somebody in charge of wardrobe to approve anything that's going to be seen on the screen. Otherwise, you are very likely to end up with a band name or a anime character or something that is copyrighted in your film. In fact, the three biggest offenders when it comes to showing off logos that don't belong in somebody's film are t-shirts, shoes, and handbags. However, I have seen logos printed on pants and on hats as well, but these three are the big ones. I tend to look out for them now. It almost became a game for me to see how many unlicensed logos could I find in a film and usually it's on these three items. Another problem that I've seen is when it comes to architecture, specifically buildings. Whenever somebody needs to enter a hotel or a bank, sometimes I see a very familiar name on that building that I'm pretty sure did not put any funding into the film. So when you're looking for locations, look for very basic, nondescript buildings, preferably ones that don't have the name anywhere near where you're planning on shooting. If you absolutely must use a building that has the company name written very boldly on it, shoot it at angles where you don't see the name. You might have to get creative with your camera angles here, but it is entirely possible to get a character into a building even if the name is right there big and bold right above the door without ever showing the name. Cars are another problem that I see a lot of. A lot of films involve motor vehicles and a lot of the time I can tell you exactly who made that vehicle. Not because I know cars but because I can see it right on the vehicle. There are two really great ways to hide this when you're dealing with scenes that don't have characters. The first way is to park the vehicle far enough where the logo is unreadable. And if you must show a car close up, the second way is to make up a bumper sticker and stick it on over that logo. I've seen some bumper stickers placed in some really odd positions on cars, but I understood exactly why they were done that way. And I don't blame those filmmakers one bit. Now another way to do this, and this works really well when you have actors in the scene, 
is to make sure that the actors are blocking the logo. It can get tricky when you have characters in motion, but some creative camera angles and following the characters can get it so you just miss seeing that logo in the scene. Another trick is to park the car in front of something like perhaps a lamppost where the logo is hidden while a character is walking towards the vehicle. Now when it comes to food and beverages, this happens an awful lot. Even nondescript brands such as grocery store brands are still brands. So don't think that just swapping out Coca-Cola for your local grocer's version of it is going to keep you safe. Really, when it comes to food and beverages, you have to keep those logos hidden. The easiest way is to stick them in cups, whether glasses or styrofoam cups or even the plain water thermos type of containers. Things like that that don't have any logos on it keep you very safe. Another trick I've seen is by using those cardboard hand grips that can be slipped over styrofoam cups work great for coffee. In a pinch, you can either turn the bottles so the labels are facing away, or you can make sure that the actor's hand is always covering the label. Now, if you got somebody creative on your crew who's got some spare time, you can always make your own labels. This works out great when you're dealing with scenes that involve bottles of alcohol. You can soak labels off of bottles. Just make sure that they're not bottles such as Frangelica that have a very, very distinctive look to them. Soak off the labels, print out your own labels, slap them on there. It may look a little cheesy close up, but if you shoot further away, you can barely tell the difference, if at all. Another trick that I've seen is by not lighting up the back of the bar. That way you see the silhouettes of the bottles, but not the actual labels. Soaking off labels works for other types of containers as well. You can turn tubes and bottles and other containers into whatever you need just by soaking off the labels and then adding your own. You can go with stickers, decals, stencils, even paint. Whatever it takes to make the product what you need it to be without featuring any real logos. Another big problem I see is usually book covers. If you have a scene where somebody's reading a book or there's magazines on the table or there are books on the bookshelves, if you can read the titles clearly, you might be in trouble. The easiest method when it comes to shooting a scene that has a bunch of bookshelves in the background is to adjust your camera so the background is slightly blurry and you can't read the titles. However, if you don't have this option, it's best to just make your own book covers or take the covers off of books in order to make the spines plain. Televisions playing is another problem I see a lot of. It's very hard not to notice when a very well-known film is playing on the TV in the background of a scene. It's even worse when that very well-known show has absolutely nothing to do with the production that you're watching. There are a couple ways to get around this. The way that I see most often used is by playing something on the television that is already in public domain. I can't tell you how many times I've seen Night of the Living Dead or Dementia 13 playing in the background of somebody's horror movie. It almost seems like cheating, but it is safe. Public domain means that it's pretty much free use at that point. However, there are other ways to do this where you don't have something quite so recognizable on the television. One is to play one of your own movies. As long as you still have the rights to it, there's no reason in the world why you can't turn that volume down and then play p bits of previous movies of yours. Or you can use stock footage. You can find many places online that sell stock footage anywhere from a few seconds to a couple minutes of pretty much anything you want. You can throw that onto the television. As long as you have the rights to use it, you're good to go. When it comes to special things that need to be on the television, such as news reports, you're safest by making your own. This could be as simple as throwing a green screen up and throwing an actor in front of the camera, having him play a news reporter, and then put him wherever you need to put him in post, or throw him against a blank wall, turn him into a news anchor. My point is, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to make your own television shows to play in your movie. 
Same goes with computers. The biggest problem I see are people using social network channels such as Facebook or Twitter or something like that when they're trying to do films where characters are communicating to each other. Don't do it unless you got permission from those companies. It's very easy to make your own fake chat room in order to do this type of a scene. Same goes with websites. Make up your own, do a mock-up, use a fake name. It can look similar to a real one, but just make sure it's not the real one. When it comes to phones, whatever you do, don't use anybody's real phone number. The most common thing that you'll see when it comes to fake numbers is anything that starts out with 555. You might want to avoid showing an actual phone number if at all possible. You can usually just go by a picture and a name showing up on a phone to let the audience know who's calling or a distinctive ringtone, but don't ever show real phone numbers and for that matter, don't show real addresses either. When it comes to some props, you might be able to find sponsors. Normally for small budget productions, this does not mean money. All it means is that a company is willing to give you some of their product in order to feature into your film. Basically, you're getting free props. They're getting free advertising. Depending on the type of film you have, you might have an easier time doing this than others. Approach small companies, independently owned, makes it easier to get through all the red tape and you sh might be able to get a lot of your props for free this way. All in all, do whatever you can to avoid using logos or other recognizable icons from any company that you don't have permission for. Otherwise, it can be a very quick way to get your film shut down, shelved, and keep you tied up in lawsuits for years to come. I hope that you enjoyed this episode of The Unconnected Filmmaker, and if you found this information useful, and want to be notified when the next video premieres, just hit that subscribe button. Or, if you have anything you'd like to see an episode on, feel free to comment below. See you next time, and keep those cameras rolling.